If you are a an independent or third party candidate, Mac, are the deadlines any different for you? There are deadlines to get on, and uh, especially like for a write-in candidate, I can I don't have those with me right at the moment, uh, but I can get those to you. Okay, uh, is it is it safe to say that those deadlines are later than the traditional deadline for Democrats and Republicans? Um, I guess we're dealing with. The uh, Mountain Party, uh, it, I guess the question, they still have to file. Let, let me get back to you. On sure. that. Let me don't, I don't want to wait that one. Let me get back to you. No problem. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> so what's the next step? We Somebody files for, they, they want to join the House of Delegates or, or the Senate or Sheriff, or is it anything that they want to run for? If it's. Say a, a, a county office, a sheriff, that can be done at the county clerk's uh, office. And that's that's for every place to go. You, but uh, as I mentioned, if the House of Delegates goes across a county line or a senatorial districts do go across the, the county line, then those are filed through the Secretary of State's office. And those are the ones that either come in in person, which is – yesterday we had uh, probably a dozen of the senators came in together. They were already down at the state house for the uh, – the interim sessions and, of course, the opening tomorrow, the legislative session. So they all came in together uh, at the Secretary of State's office. But to answer your question, if, if it's a county commission seat, a sheriff, uh, something local, then go to the county clerk's office uh, or go to their website to file. And, and are there fees associated with this? Yes, there are. It's usually 1 percent of the uh, pay that the uh, of that office. Uh, John, let me interrupt for just a moment here. Just in from Alert Berkeley, Interstate 81, southbound mile marker 2, uh, shoulder and number 1 lane shut down at this time. This just broke within the last few minutes here. So if you're heading uh, south on Interstate 81, it's going to slow down as you get close to the Virginia line. And, again, that's at mile marker 2. John? I, there's So once people have declared their candidacy, What's their next step? Does it then go to their campaign manager and, and whatever they put together? Is this... it, It's then time to, to start the campaigning, uh, raising money, getting out, uh, getting on your radio talk show, uh, the typical uh, campaign. The, the deadlines, there are some key deadlines that uh, I could get through a couple of those real quick. Uh, the filing period, as we mentioned, January 8th through the 27th, March 29th is when the absentee ballots start going out. So the, the actual voting begins at the end of March with these uh, absentee ballots go out. If you want to vote absentee, you do have to have fit one of the 11 reasons that the legislature has given. We are not a no-excuse absentee ballot state. So you, there's a form. It will give you those 11 options. You check the box that fits your situation. Say you're going to be out of town on business. You're going to uh, be in the hospital, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, that you can go ahead and apply for that right now through the, your, through the county clerk. The date to the deadline for changing your voter registration, if you want to change from one party to the other, that is April 23rd. That's 21 days prior to the election, and that's to give the clerks time to make sure the address is, is proper, get you the right ballot when you go to vote, get you send you the information what you, where your precinct is, that sort of thing. Uh, early voting starts May 1st and goes through May 11th. Um, there are some deadlines in February if you want to, if you file to run and then want to get off the ballot. I think February 13th is the deadline to come off the ballot, um, and then the ballot draw, uh, the, you know, where the positions where each candidate appears on the ballot. I think it's February 20th, 21st, right in there. Um, but so that's pretty particular. We do have a voter or a candidate's guide that has all those key dates in there for the candidates. But for your the, the typical listener, the main thing that we're wanting people to do now is pay attention to things such as your voter registration. Make sure you're ready to go. If you want to work the polls, get that in. Uh, let your county clerk know. Um, and then the idea behind working the polls is we're wanting to build confidence in these elections. Right now, America's so divided, and there's conspiracy theories and fraud theories and so forth. If you work at the polls, you're going to see all the checks and balances. You'll see that the uh, voting machines are not connected to the Internet. You'll see the chain of custody on these ballots. And then you can spread that word to your family and friends. 
on social media that, at least here in West Virginia, these elections are being run uh, very securely, very safe, and very transparent. So the logic and accuracy testing on these machines, that's a public uh, process that clerks will notify through your uh, radio station, through the newspaper, said, here's the date that we're going to test the machines. And you can go and be a part of that process. And I encourage people to do so if you have questions about the legitimacy of the machines or the election process. So that's why we're talking about this now. The election year is upon us, and it's time to pay attention to those things if you're interested in the political process. We're talking with West Virginia Secretary of State Mac Warner. He had hoped to be in studio this morning, but he is uh, marooned on some difficult roads in western Maryland on I, uh, I-68. So we're talking with Mac uh, via telephone. Poll workers got a raise over the last year, too. I, I think in Berkeley County, it went up to maybe $300 uh, for the day. Those those rates are set by the county clerks, correct, Mac? They are, and I think that may be the highest in the state. Uh, so take advantage of that, everybody in Berkeley County. Uh, they're taking care of you. And uh, it just shows the importance, the emphasis that uh, the county does place on elections. Uh, Berkeley County is one of the larger counties. And uh, You've got quite the representation out there in the state legislature. Those are very important races. So uh, just real, I think a lot of the state is envious of what you've got going on in the panhandle. You're doing things right. And uh, let's keep it up. Let's get a large participation in this uh, in this upcoming election. And if you're interested at all in running for office, now is the time. You've got 20 days left to, uh, to file for office. Hey, Mac, as, as you know, I'm a fairly recent transplant to West Virginia, coming from Virginia, where it's all open primaries. Anybody can vote anywhere. What happens here if a, a declared Republican or a, player, uh, or a Democrat voter just changes their mind at the last minute? Can they still, can a declared Republican still vote at the Democrat, uh, Democratic primary? No, both are uh, open at the moment. But you have to, if you're an independent or a non-affiliated uh, member, if that's what your registration is, you have to pick one or the other. You can pick the Republican or the Democrat. Now, there are, are discussions in, in either or both parties to close those uh, primaries, but that has not happened yet. Uh, so if you're a Republican in the primary, you do have to vote a Republican ballot. Democrat, you vote a Democrat ballot. And it's those non-affiliated members. And that's about... Uh, 24%. Uh, right now, uh, let me give you some numbers real quick. About 39% of the registered voters are Republican, about 31% are Democrat, and about 24% are non affiliated. So it's that 24% pick either a Republican ballot or a Democrat ballot in the uh, in the primary. So what is the la- <clears throat> last news happens, right? So things, if, if, if I'm a devout Democrat or devout Republican and then just my candidate does something and turns me off and I say, you know what, this is two days before the election, I don't want him anymore. I want to go with somebody else. Is that an option for a voter? Well, you can't change and, and vote a different uh, ballot. So that's the idea behind a primary. This, right. That is when the Republicans are picking their candidates, the Democrats are picking theirs to go to the general election. So if you're a registered Republican, you will only be given that Republican ballot. Your option at that point is to, to do a write-in if, if there's somebody that's uh, eligible to be for a write-in candidacy. Um, to, I think maybe where you're trying to get to is, and that's why I gave that date of April 23rd, if something were to happen and you wanted to take the party to vote for someone in another party, you would have to make that change before April 23rd uh, to then be able to vote uh, that a different ballot uh, on the May 14th primary. Mac, you have a military background, uh, many members of your family as well. Can you tell me what the situation was like before you came into office and if you've had to make any changes or enhancement to it to allow those who are stationed outside of West Virginia, maybe even outside of the country, to make it easy for those folks on active duty or those who are posted elsewhere to vote in a primary or general election? Yes. Uh, I had trouble voting when I was in Afghanistan. Uh, my children, all of whom have served, they've each had troubles in their postings across the globe. And uh, that's why I took the initiative to uh, allow military members to vote using a mobile device. Uh, when you're on a hillside in Afghanistan, the U.S. Postal Service doesn't deliver there, but you get information through uh, uh, Internet and phone activity. 
And so West Virginia has led the nation with allowing military and overseas citizens to vote using a mobile device. We did that back in 2018, and it was so successful that uh, in 2020 and then 22, we expanded that to voters with certain disabilities and first responders. We had had the situation where a number of first responders from West Virginia went to Mississippi to help in a uh, hurricane disaster relief, and it was just four days prior to the election. That was inside the six-day window. You have to ask for an absentee ballot at least six days prior to the election. So we brought that to the legislature's attention, and they said, certainly, uh, if anybody deserves the right to vote, it's first responders, people with certain uh, disabilities, and military. So we've led the nation with that. We've improved the technology so that we can actually verify that the vote that the uh, military member casts on a hillside in Afghanistan is the same vote that is received by the county clerk back in Berkeley County. Uh, so that has caught on with several other states. Now other states are copying what we've done. Uh, I do not advocate this for mainstream voting. I only advocate it for those people who would otherwise be disenfranchised because of their service to our country or state or other uh, physical disabilities. So appreciate you asking about that, and it's a great thing because I was just told uh, yesterday of a unit that is deployed out of uh, near Parkersburg. It's down on the border, the southern border. Uh, helping with uh, you know, the, the processing and the people coming across the border, uh, they would certainly be el eligible to vote using a mobile device uh, as well because uh, of their – in the military, you're frequently moved from one place to another. You're deployed, but you're moving around that uh, deployed area of operations, and so it's hard for the mail to catch up with you, and that's why we've enabled our legislature as about us. Uh, to do this. So thanks for asking about that. It's a good thing. If anybody has a military member that is deployed, make sure they know that they can vote using their mobile device. All the, it, it's part of that application I mentioned earlier, the 11 reasons to have, vote absentee. You simply mark that you want an electronic uh, ballot, and the clerk will get that to you. You had, upon taking office, uh, undertaken the task of purging West Virginia's voter registration rolls of those whose names should no longer be on the list. Either they moved out of state, uh, passed away, uh, what have you. Has the bulk of that work been completed, Mac? And do you have to continue to do maintenance on that list regularly? <laughs> well, as we've talked before, I don't like to use the word purge. What we've done is we've cleaned the rolls of names, not people, but of names of people who have deceased, who have moved, duplicates. It, it's a cleansing of the voter rolls. It's not taking people off. It's, it's removing those excess names. And what that does is it makes the actual uh, voting on Election Day much uh, much easier. Uh, you're, when you go through those poll books, you're not looking through. And, and catch this, we've taken off over 400,000 names. Think of that. In this small state, that's how bloated our rolls have gotten. So over 400,000 names have come off those rolls, and we haven't had one complaint, one uh, person say, hey, I was taken off and probably had no lawsuits. We just got after it with the county clerks. And again, I don't take those names off. We simply provide the information to the county clerks. They verify that that person has died or moved or whatever. They remove those names, and that's because the county clerks are closest to the people. They understand. Uh, they, they can verify that the person has moved and that sort of thing. So uh, that has taken place. Now, just to answer your question, just in the last month, we have come upon the uh, two-year requirement for the NCOA, that's the National Change of Address uh, process. This is by law from back in 1993, um, where they said every two years you, you're supposed to do this. And that's what has happened is my predecessors had not cleaned the rolls, and that's why the, the rolls have gotten so uh, bloated. But with the work of the clerks, uh, we, we've gotten that cleaned up. We sent out over 100,000 applications uh, of changes that have occurred over the last two years. Many of those are coming back. I was just talking with the county clerk yesterday. She said she'd gotten about 200 back. Um, and so the process is working. So there is more to be done, but I think we've done the bulk of the work uh, to answer your question uh, over the last several years. Is the Secretary of State's office governed mostly by state law or federal law in regards to what your office does and can do? Well, it, it combination uh, the 1993 law that I mentioned was a national uh, law uh, that was if you remember back to those days it was before the internet before the cell phones all that sort of thing and what they decided to do was uh, have kind of a two 
parts to this law, so it satisfied both Republicans and Democrats or conservatives and liberals. One was to allow people to register through the uh, departments of motor vehicles. So when you go in to get your driver's license, you're offered that opportunity. Do you want to register to vote? That's to add people to the rolls. The second uh, piece of that is, though, every two years we're going to clean that up. We're going to have this process where we identify people that have moved through the national change of address to the Postal Service, and we're going to send notifications out to people. And if you have moved from the state, then you're taken off. That, that's the federal law. Then you get into the state law that deals with um, the particulars of um, – we, we run things differently. We don't do vote by mail. Oregon and uh, Colorado and some of these other states failed. Well, just imagine in West Virginia if we had done that before this voter roll cleanup, we would have had 400,000 active ballots sitting out there in mailboxes. Just think of the opportunities for fraud or misuse and that sort of thing. So uh, that's why I'm real pleased with the way our West Virginia legislature has given us 11 specific reasons if you want to vote by mail, vote absentee. You have to fit one of those reasons, and that can be verified by another voter, by a county clerk, that you are, in fact, in the hospital or deployed, that sort of thing. So that's why I think the West Virginia elections are the most secure in the nation. I've been asked four times to go over and testify in front of Congress, and I just had a call last week about another opportunity uh, to go testify. Uh, because of the success we've had in West Virginia, uh, other states are wanting to know, how did we clean up our roles? How do we have such confidence? Why, how are we able to report results on election night? All those things that add confidence to our system, and it's why West Virginia is now a model for the rest of the nation uh, for election integrity and security. Hey, Mac, I want to get back to down to this breakdown by party, which I found <clears throat> rather startling that there's such a robust independent um, uh, party here in West Virginia. Do you have a sense whether or not that is – uh, reflected in the national numbers as well, or is that kind of specific to West Virginia? No, that's uh, specific to West Virginia. When I get to your station, I can bring you a, a sheet with some of the numbers uh, on that. But uh, it, it, see, it's, it's all a matter part of this whole thing, whether the primaries are open and closed and that sort of, sort of thing. When you have an open primary, that is, you know, those non-affiliated can pick the, choose the Republican or Democrat. It kind of encourages people to become independents or, or non-affiliated, so they have that choice. One year you might like to vote for Barack Obama, the next year you might want to vote for Donald Trump, and if you're non-affiliated, you could do that in the primary. Um, and that's why I think both parties are talking about or looking at perhaps closing uh, their primaries, and then that forces those non-affiliated, if they want to participate in the primaries, to pick one or the other. So, uh, but each state is different, whether their primaries are open or closed. In fact, some states, one parties are open and the others are not. Uh, so uh, that's a state by state situation. Uh, it, I think the numbers I just told you about do not reflect the national trend. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're if you're doing a little Venn diagram of voters, I want to see those conjoining circles where the person voted for Barack Obama and <laughs> Donald Trump. I wonder how many people fit that description. That was just a hypothetical <laughs> make, make my point. I think you've been getting into the rum cake back there, Mac. <laughs> That's what I think. Well, hey, there's also a problem in, in... We're just about out of time, okay. John. I'm sorry to cut you That's off right. here. Uh, but Mac, final word is yours, sir. No, I just encourage everybody. I really appreciate you all talking about this. It gets the word out there. Everybody knows the election year is upon us, but now everybody has their... They have the right to vote, but to exercise that right, you have certain responsibilities, and that is getting, making sure your registration is up to date and then getting involved in the process. I encourage people to run for office. I encourage people to uh, become a poll worker and uh, study the candidates now that we're starting the other filings. I probably had over 100 filings in my office yesterday. That is online. This is the last thing. Go vote wv.com. Go to that website, and you can start seeing who all has filed for the offices officially, and you can start learning about the candidates. Mac, thanks so much. I appreciate you uh, making the call along I-68 there this morning. Absolutely. Look forward to seeing you all later in the day. Absolutely.